my friends. I want to introduce to you the Vanguard Agency. They are fit for Texas. They are in the business of helping people to save money. For all of insurance needs, the Vanguard Agency cannot wait to work with you. Get a quote for your home, get a quote for your auto, a quote for your business and restaurant. They are ready to shop your insurance policies with top-rated insurance companies. Go see my friend Humberto Garcia. He's been in the business a long time and makes an effort to make your insurance policy needs as seamless as possible for all of you. Tell him you heard about them here when you call him at 281-453-8770. They speak Spanish, and I know they will take care of you. Back to the podcast. I am so excited to share with you that we are starting the new season, season seven, with a lot of really cool changes, a lot of really great um, things that we're adding to to it. If you have not noticed, we are definitely starting a few of our episodes with some stories. So for today, I've got the story for you. <laughs> My favorite. So. Not long ago, I guess maybe it was like a week ago. What are we today? Today, yeah. So it was about a week ago. Um, my husband Rusk and I were invited to attend a a real estate investors. Um, uh, I guess it was a little networking event, but they also wanted to kind of bring in some investors and talk to them about what they're doing in terms of like, um, uh, you know, coming in and buying apartment complexes. That's really what it was, just for apartment complexes. And so uh, excited, wanted to go and see that. We've been thinking about buying a few multi-unit family apartments. We've also, you know, talked about um, investing in uh, in Airbnbs, doing a, a, few, a few more of those things. So this was a good opportunity for he and I to go and meet some people who are doing it in the city and how they're doing it and, you know, what kinds of things we could learn from them. The whole thing was great. It was really nice. It took place at the Arnold's Brewery. It was a really nice uh, event. It was well organized. Everything was um, well put together. The speakers were great. Everybody had a, a good a good story they shared about how they got started and, and how they've been um, creating uh, wealth and creating um, their portfolios through multifamily investments. And um, kind of towards the end of the event, I think it was maybe, I guess, five minutes before it was over, it, it was, it, they were networking, there were speakers, it was great, it was, everything was nice, but towards the end and towards the, um, the, f- the final moments of the event, I have this one person come up to me and says, hey, how do you do, you know, what do you do, et cetera, et cetera, oh, this is what I do, this is, you know, who I am, and this is my husband, et cetera, et cetera, and then I mentioned to him that I'm a podcaster, and he says, oh, really, you're a podcaster? He says, yeah, I'm, I, I'm a podcaster, too, and I said, wow, well, that's cool, that's amazing, how long have you been doing it? He said, oh, maybe about three, three or four years now, I said, great, I said, this is my second year, and I love it, it's, you know, something that I, I get to enjoy, and I get to teach and inspire and motivate people. And um, he's like, wow, that's great. You know, good, good for you. He kind of like said it like in a really kind of like a little bit of like, a, oh, yeah, well, you know, you, you do your little podcast. Mine is really serious. Uh, that kind of conversation. He looks at me and he says, um, so when do you start your podcast? I said, well, it's, you know, my new season's coming. And I said, I'm actually looking for sponsors right now. I'm looking for people who want to be a part of it. And he's like, why would you look for sponsors? And I you know, I was like, well, because, you know, I think it's it's time for me. It's a, it's the next, uh, you know, level for my podcast. I've been doing it two years. I think it's time for, you know, for, for people to also have the opportunity to advertise. And, and he looks at me and goes, you know, I don't advertise and I've been doing it for four years. Uh, I never even thought about advertising or, you know, offering it to anyone because I just don't feel like I'm ready. What makes you think that you're ready? And I thought, 
I have to be ready for it? What do you mean? I have to be ready for advertisers or for, he goes, yeah, well, you know, what makes you think that what you're doing is, is, is good for somebody to advertise in your podcast? And I looked at him like, I, I don't understand the question and I don't understand your comment. I'm not sure what you mean. He was just like, well, you know, I, I've been doing, he goes, I think this is my 150th episode. And, you know, I just don't feel like I would still at this point have the nerve to ask anyone to, you know, to give me some of their money so that they can advertise on my podcast. He goes, and I have speakers from all over the world and my speakers are, you know, real estate moguls. And and I, I kind of looked at him like, well, you know, for me, I think it's the right time. I have created a media kit. I feel like very positive about my value and what I give to the people that, um, that want to advertise in the podcast. I think, you know, what I do that's really, really cool is I really promote the things that I believe in and the things that I really like and that I share. Only those things that for me are important. I said, I don't know why you wouldn't do it. I think it's a great idea that you should. I said, maybe um, you should think it again. And so he looks at me and just says, yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe one day I'll have the nerve and I'll have that audacity to ask people for money. I'm like, wow. I just kind of like, oh, okay. Um, it was a really, it was, it was kind of like he was trying to bring me down a notch. Like, girl, you are still nothing. You don't compare to me. I'm a big podcaster. I, you know, I have all of these guests and I have moguls on my podcast. And, you know, who are you to think that, you know, you're, you, you deserve to have this, um, this advertising component to your podcast. You, he, he asked me, well, how many episodes do you have? I said, well, I'm at 70. And I'm like, really proud of that. Um, uh, Yep. Nope. Not, <laughs> not. It didn't move him. He was just very. And so I moved on from this guy, just kind of like baffled by this whole conversation. I talked to Rusk. I talked to my husband. I said, man, this guy was kind of nasty. He kind of like told me, like, who do you think you are? Like, you know, going to, to people and asking them to advertise on your podcast. It, it, I don't they, He says he doesn't do it. And he could because he has all of these listeners and he's got all of these downloads and and I just kind of thought, you know, I feel like there's moments where men just have to, like, let you know they, they're they still superior. They're still above. They're still at that level, you know, where they're still feeling, uh, yeah, girl, you need to, you know, be, you need to be taken down a notch. You, you, you're getting a little too ahead of yourself. You're feeling a little too good about yourself. Mm -mm. I think we need somebody needs to tell you that you need to just calm down and like you know be a good girl and you know say save yourself you know the embarrassment by you know asking for ad money and promos and 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 yeah you know I felt very like like attacked um, I felt like he was trying to kind of like bring me down. Yeah, you're up here. I need to bring you back down to earth, girl. You're not. And so I, I looked at, at my husband and I'm like, it's interesting how there's moments when I go to these very heavy male dominated events, like this investor group was maybe 85% male and maybe 15% female. Um, and they still don't want us to be a part of those groups. They still don't, they, you know, he could have asked me if I was an investor. And what kind of portfolio we have. And I said, yeah, you know, I could have told him, you know, that we do have a, a, a nice portfolio that Rusk and I work on together. Uh, and then my husband brings me on because he trusts my judgment. He trusts my, my, my business acumen. And I'm really good at reading people. And we work together as a team. And so he felt, I don't know, he felt some kind of way about it. And I think he had to kind of let me know that, yeah, you know, don't get too, don't get too excited about yourself. You still have a long way to go. Which, by the way, 70 episodes is something to be super excited about. I am really proud of it. And I'm very proud of what I give you. I am very proud to bring you some of the best people around the city of Houston. I'm, you know, always looking for ways to provide for my audience inspiration, motivation, education. And I feel like I've been doing that for the last two years. And if somebody's threatened by that or threatened by my confidence... Uh, that's too bad. That's your problem. That's not mine. And I'm going to continue to do that. I'm going to continue to ask people if they want to sponsor my podcast because I have great value. I really believe in what I do. 
And that translates to everything that I do in my life, you know. And and once one person joins me and joins my my vibe and my tribe and my team, they're going to be a part of it forever. That's something that I'm really um, passionate about is loyalty and having that commitment to to the products and the people and the services that I really believe in. So that's too bad. I mean, too bad for him and too bad that that's, that's a situation. And I kind of feel like, yeah, these, these male-dominated places, I think, are not ready for females. And maybe they're not ready for the female who, who comes in strong, who comes in confident and it's interesting how he spoke to me in a, in this kind of nasty tone when I was away from my husband. I think if Rusk was around, this guy would have never looked at me or talked to me the way he did. Because, yeah, <laughs> my dude would have been like, oh, uh-uh. <laughs> yeah, my, my producer, um, Jamal, is here. He knows exactly what I'm talking about. So yeah, that's my story, and I hope I hope that it motivates you to keep going. And you know, when you find those moments in your life, you know, you just look at it and say, "Okay, that's your problem and not mine." End of story. You guys, I want to introduce to you my skincare expert, Natalia Castile. Everyone wants to know how in the world do I have the most gorgeous, beautiful skin? Yeah, thank you very much. I know. And it is because of her. Natalia Castile is my go-to skincare specialist. She takes care of me. And I'm telling you, you guys will love her. You will find her at the ACPS. It is the Aesthetic Center for plastic surgery and if you really really want to know more about them you can visit them at their website acps plastic surgery it is a med spa that i love to go to it's so easy just calling in and say i need to set up an appointment for my facial with natalia and they take care of me immediately in and out they take care of skin rejuvenation they do something called derma infusion they do cool sculpting, and Natalia does all of that. She's also taking care of my laser needs. Like, she does laser reduction for me, and I swear to you, people say, oh, it's painful. She makes it so painless. Love, love, love her. So if you need to find out more about how you can get great skin, follow her at her Instagram, Natalia Castile, at Natalia Castile. You will not regret it. I will give you guys all the details, and she will take care of you. I promise you she will do a great job for your skin. You will not regret it, and you will have the best skin of 2022. Y'all, nothing beats a healthier ride than a 45-minute spin class at Cycle Bar with you. Y'all know I've been on a journey of health and wellness. My doctor recommended that I do cardio to improve my blood pressure. It's been high and I have hypertension and nothing has worked better than the Cycle Bar West U class. I'm telling you, Cycle Bar has the smart bikes. They will calculate your distance and your calories. The music's great. The vibe is great. The lighting is amazing. And the trainers really want to make you have that amazing experience. I don't know if I mentioned this to you. But if you wanted to, you can ask for your favorite workout songs. They want this to be about you. They want you to have the best experience possible. And by the way, I am letting you know now that they have a new rider three pack for only $49. Amazing. You find them at 3233 Southwest Freeway. Or you can also reach out to them at 713-677-0477. And their email is westu at cyclebar.com. Ask for Guillermo. He's going to take care of you. If you don't do anything else for the rest of the day and you do the cycle bar with you class, I'm telling you, you're going to walk out and you're going to feel like a badass. So I shared the story of uh, the investors meeting from last week right. where I was kind of like, you know, uh, I put down a peg by, uh, by uh, a macho male. Yeah. <laughs> by the way, guys. He my guest, my my guest today is Russ, my husband. I didn't bring any wine today, sorry, my, folks. So you're silly without wine. So see, you yeah, can do it without it. I can do. It you can it. do this without wine. Right. But I don't. I don't, I was called last minute, impromptu, get in the I car, know, come over here, yeah, I need start you. talking. Put you? your thinking caps on. <laughs> Damsel in distress. 
<laughs> Needed some help. I was telling in the in the in the story how that guy had the nerve to talk to me the way he did because you weren't around. <laughs> Because if you were there sitting next to me or standing oh, yeah. next to me, you would right. have never spoken to me the wow. way he did. Yeah, you seem you seem like you're pretty flustered after. Yeah, I was kind of like right. taken aback, a little well, bewildered. Well, so it's a typical male domination kind of conversation. Yeah, it's, it's kind of representative of feels like 80, 85 percent men in that room and no. ten or fifteen percent women. Yeah, and it's interesting how you know when you and I show up to these things together, yeah. um, there's like a division. There's sort right. of like a division that happens between you know where the men go and they yeah. like talk about you know their thing and then when they talk to the women they talk about other things they don't talk business like i don't think he ever asked or any of the people asked yeah. me what kind of investments i do or what kind of things we i you know invest in or yeah. you know what my portfolio looks like but every time they talk to you they always want to know oh what do you do you invest in commercial do you invest in residential right. do you buy property do you, and it's always a, that kind of thing. And right. I think maybe it's just a matter well, it's, of... It's, I think it's an unconscious bias. Right. I think it's ingrained in them to marginalize women or minorities in certain settings. And I think they just do it sub subconsciously because yeah. of their everyday kind of experiences. I don't think uh, it should be that way because there were women there. And, and when those speakers raised their hand about who wants to invest, women raised their hands as well. Right. I was there. I was in the back of the room and I saw it take place. Right, and I think there's an assumption that uh, women are, don't belong there, I think. Right. It's, it's, it's like you said, it's a subconscious, unconscious, unconscious bias. Yeah, yeah. There's that, that sense of like, what are they doing here? Like, Or with me, when I come in with you, they just assume, oh, he just brought his wife with right. him. And, and they don't really know that you and I really have like right. um, dialogue. Yeah. And we really talk about the process of what we're investing in. And you put me into the process as well. Exactly. It's not just me standing there yeah. next to you saying, yes, yes, yes. You'll ask me questions about, you know, what do you think about, you know, the community surrounding or what do you think about this, this person? Like he's, he seems a little shady to me. What do you think? And I always right. get a good sense of people. Yeah. So I'm, I'm always brought in to kind of like, also look at the people yeah. and, and, and kind of gauge whether some of them are like real, fake, yeah. authentic, and, and, and actual. Right. And there was, there, was, there was two other couples there Business. that I had noticed. And I got, you know, I, I probably picked up on it because it, it uh, resembled or replicated our relationship. So I just assumed that mm -hmm. they were probably doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it's, you just need to go into a room of people that you don't know and just assume that. They're all in it together, and you can't assume mm -hmm. what somebody knows and what somebody doesn't know based on the way they're dressed, mm -hmm. because the best dressed are not always the people that know the most, and the ones yeah. that are that came in with tennis shoes and t-shirts could be, you know, very successful investors. So yeah. So know. talking about dressing, do you think that men and women um, have a, have to change the way they dress in order to be taken seriously? I'm just giving you the example of like Elizabeth Holmes. Like she felt like she had to change yes. the way she looked and yeah. she wanted to look more like Steve Jobs right. um, to backs. be taken seriously. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it goes back to that unconscious bias. Again, successful people typically dress the successful part. It's not always the case, but it's what society requires of us. And the more successful you are, the more... Uh, the more your attire is supposed to cost. And I think that's what people are looking for, the cars you kind of drive, or the mm -hmm. houses that you live mm -hmm. in, all material. But, you know, that's not always the case. I mean, no. you know, it really, you're really supposed to dress to the occasion, not really Agreed. dress to the success of, of what you are. Because, mm -hmm. like I said at the beginning, there are some very well-dressed people in a room not necessarily having any experience or have any success degree. We're mm -hmm. talking about in investing. And there were some people that were underdressed and could have been, you know. Yeah, but you know, right. they always say like dress for the position you're looking for right. or dress for the, that part. Yeah. Yeah, because that's what society requires of us. You know, because yeah, and I think women are, right. are hit harder in that right. sense. I think if, if a woman walks in underkept, disheveled, right. and maybe not her hair and makeup done, yep. they are going to look at her down. Right. They're not going to, you know, consider her as seriously as they would consider a, yeah. a woman who comes in, you know, presentable and you know, um, well-dressed right. and she's got a suit on or the power, you know, suits and that kind of thing. Yeah. And that goes back to your original point about Elizabeth Holmes. And that's, I think why she did what she did because mm -hmm. tech world and particularly Silicon Valley is so anti, there are so many barriers to entry for women to succeed there. that she knew that she had to play that role for whatever psychology that was going on behind it. She knew that in order to make, any inroads mm -hmm. in that particular industry, she really had to play the part. She yeah. had to look like that computer geek 
that kind of mm-hmm. above, you know, that conscious subconscious level as that Adam Newman's wife talks about elevated consciousness yes, kind of elevated deal. Elevated consciousness. Right. So I think she she realized she had to play that part. The problem now is is that she failed at what she was doing mm-hmm. and it was an entire fraud. It's not like, you know, the technology didn't work out. It's not like the technology was working and she just made, you know, some mm-hmm. some factors that kind of shut her yeah. down. She was a fraud from beginning to the end. And mm-hmm. now the barrier to entry for women in that industry is just that much, that more, much higher, more difficult. Right? Yeah. Because everyone's going to associate any woman trying to succeed in the tech industry has right. that extra has, has yeah. that persona to, to you know, why, why I wanted to do this episode with you is because I feel like, you know, there's, there's such a, a way a perception, a way of people looking at men and women in terms of like how they conduct themselves as business people or conduct themselves as founders. Like I just spoke about Elizabeth Holmes, you mentioned Adam Newman. And I think it's because, you know, recently we've been watching a lot of these um, founder shows. Like we crashed was um, the, the, we work story. story. Elizabeth Holmes, the dropout, we watched that. And we've been kind of like, every time we watch them, we analyze these personalities and we always wonder. Right. um, We also watch Super Pomp with Travis Kalanick. Super Pomp with the Travis Kalanick. The founder of Uber. And then the Anna Delvey thing with the... um, Inventing Anna. Inventing Anna, right. right. And she was also a woman who was trying to, you know, impress and and get herself out there and and, and do like a big philanthropy. But I feel like there's, there's such a difference between how women are perceived, they're perceived as like liars if they do something wrong. But Travis Kalanick, in, 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 he lied in so many mm-hmm. other ways, the way he circumvented, right. you know, the law. And so right. how many ways he was able to get away with things. Mm-hmm. And he he wasn't perceived, he wouldn't go to jail. I mean, right. you know, he wasn't perceived as evil and terrible and horrible. Yeah. But the women are. Yes. You know, Anna ends up ends up in jail, and Elizabeth is right. probably going to go to jail. Right. So there, there's slightly different storylines in the corporate side that took place in Uber versus in Theranos. Theranos, she did something fraudulent. The Uber guy was just a uh, was an antisocial, was a very narcissistic personality kind of, you know, charismatic individual. Mm-hmm. He ne- necessarily didn't do anything illegal. He just had was a lavish spender, focused on revenue, and not profit. And she was trying to do something that was you know depriving investors of of their of their but investment. you don't think that's but, but the difference is is that yeah. there is absolutely a double standard mm-hmm. for men than it is for women because if women have the same kind of personality as travis Connick, mm-hmm. they're they're viewed as being bitch or being overbearing or controlling very manipulative controlling. and that's natural that's mm-hmm. that's what men are expected to be when they head a large organization yeah. like yeah, that yeah. so it's, it's definitely it's just it's unfortunately that unconscious bias that the nature of a woman is not supposed to be that way. The mm-hmm. nature of man is. It just goes into the testosterone and the estrogen, the whole psychology behind uh-huh. the difference in the biology between the two sexes. It shouldn't so be that way. So how do we bridge that, that gap, though? How do we close that gap? How do we make it so that it's not such a, a severe... Like Martha right. Stewart, for example, is known to have a right. very strong, right. opinionated, brassy yeah. you know, uh, attitude and personality. And right. she's, she led a company for many, many years. I mean, she's still leading her yeah. company for many years. Yeah. How do we go from like accepting a Martha Stewart type of person and maybe not accepting like a younger woman who comes in and like has these right. really intense ways of doing things personality only, only with success so it has, to be, pro- have to, has be, to be proven it has to be proven only success can bridge that gap and you know it takes time i'm not a social scientist i haven't done empirical evidence studies of the last hundred years right, right. but it takes time and eventually maybe over the next over by the end of the century it'll be this conversation will be mute and nobody know what Nobody will be able to refer to what we were talking about. Mm-hmm. But the problem is that you get the bad apples and they ruin it for all the good apples. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, there's the, I believe the head of Ford is a woman. And I think the head of Pepsi at one time was a woman. I think the head of GM, Harry Barra, is also a woman. And right. a lot of them are all, all kind of flying under the radar. And mm-hmm. because they're not, they're, they're not doing anything sexy. They're running, you know, very blue chip kind of companies. And as long as they're profitable, you know, there's mm-hmm. going to be a track record. But you, yeah. but you need a track record of the women doing you know, the, the sexy, the, the new technology kind mm-hmm. of businesses, and they probably And there's are. a few. There's, there's the girl a from Bumble. There's the woman right. from Bumble. I can't remember her name. Right. But, but it, it's, yeah. It's just going to take, it just takes time. The the woman who leads uh, Rent the Runway as yeah. well, like they, they've been able to also secure a lot of funding and investors into what they do. But I just find like it's such a, it's just such a difficult thing to, to, 
just to see and just like yeah. it's so upsetting sometimes when I see that happen, you know, to, to some women who are really working really, really hard to try to make sure. a difference and do something well and 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 and, and do their own thing. And I, I pers- and it always feels right. like a man has to just always take you down yeah. a notch and tell you don't you know Yeah, there's there's you don't really deserve that. Not right. yet, maybe. Right. Like who are you to that, think that? That just comes in my opinion, that just comes purely from insecurity. That comes from own shortcomings yeah. or their own personal failings. And they're just trying to bring people down to the level. And that just, I think, happens across the board. You know, I'm not trying to say that my, I, I get discriminated against too by mostly other white men. And if I don't, I don't. Really? Right. If I don't get, if yeah. I, I don't have the look of a successful white guy, I'm not, you know, I'm not skinny. I'm not, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't carry myself as what a typical corporate kind of guy that's successful or an investor, what, what the persona of the unconscious bias of what people that are successful are supposed to look like. Mm-hmm. But once they start talking to me and find out the investments that we've made and the success, and they all, you know, then it, it, that bias then starts being chipped away slowly and surely. And I'm not trying to compare my experiences mm-hmm. to, mm-hmm. for example, experience by women or minority. No, or yeah, it's color. different. Mm-hmm. It's, it's very more, it's, it's much more in depth. Mine are microaggressions. Mm-hmm. Mine are not overt. Mm-hmm. They're little comments, you know, here and mm-hmm. there. But I get that too, so I can understand that, know what what it is to go go through what you went through with that yeah no and silly i think conversation that right and right. i think the 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 conversation and the story that i shared earlier was because i always feel like i walk in and there's imposter syndrome going on for me all the time like i don't belong in these places i don't belong in these conversations what am i doing here like but then at the same time i always feel like okay well i've earned my place here i've i've you know i'm I'm 46. I'm not, you know, 18, 19, 20. I've gained right. years of experience. Yeah. I've had my own business. I've done stuff, you know, as a teacher, as a as a professor at the university. Like I have to remind myself that I do belong in these places and I do that I I I am qualified to have yeah. these conversations yeah. and to be there when <laughs> these men you know, are, are feeling like, oh, you know, this is our place. Well, you know, it could be a place for a woman as well. Like, right. it's not just for you. Yeah. I don't know. I think a lot of women also, like, I, I think I benefit because you also are very open. You've always right. been super good about yeah. including me in everything that you do. And I think if men and husbands and boyfriends were were more supportive of their women, I think women would also find ways to 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 expand themselves and put themselves in those places another barrier to entry is that women are typically the natural uh, child givers in the in the and those who raise at home and so giving women an opportunity in the workforce Mm -hmm. or in any in any kind of form of employment there's always Mm -hmm. a sense that if you don't have kids you're probably going to have kids soon Mm -hmm. and then Mm -hmm. you're going to lose productivity because you're not obviously Mm -hmm. able to do it even though you know, you can work from home, you know, from time to time. Right. But it's that whole that whole kind of mentality that that women are or that's their natural role in society. And that's that's also being chipped. You know, guys are staying at home, too. Now women are going into the workforce, mm-hmm. but it's mm-hmm. still overwhelmingly uh, on the male side than it yeah. is on the women's yeah. side. I mean, I can understand that there's traditional roles and there's a sense where I feel as myself like I I want to be home and cook for the boys. I want right. to make sure that. You're taken care of that, you know, if you wake up in the morning and you're, you know, you're thirsty that I get you something to drink. I mean, I want to be of service as well. But at the same time, being that person doesn't mean I cannot be both. Both, right. right. Be that right. that woman that goes to you with you right. to your networking luncheons right. or to your meetings right. and, and sit there and listen and, and take in what's going on and sure. be a participant in it. Right. I think a lot of times women have this assumption that, you know, to be a good mom, you have to give up all of those things. And I think, yeah, to some extent you can't do as much, Mm -hmm. but I don't know. My boys are being raised knowing that, you know, that women can do it and that. that. No, they're capable. Everyone's capable. You just got to find the right time and to find the right balance. And I think a lot of time people, my experience, a lot of time people find they overwhelm themselves with too much going on because Mm -hmm. they have a little bit of that FOMO going on and they get invited to this and get invited to that. And they're Mm -hmm. always overwhelmed on the go. I think you need to weed out a lot of things that are not worthy or, or about distractions. There are too many distractions that yeah. don't value your time properly. I, yeah. I think you need to just do a few things at a time at a day at a time. And uh, because th- that way, nothing ever really gets done efficiently. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, I think when you one lesson that I learned last year and um, something you and I have talked about a lot in the past is 
you know, because I overcommit and I've over, you know, done my, my time and giving of myself, I have become sick. I got right. sick and I had to come to a realization that I needed to get checked and I needed to, to, to just to like take it back a notch on all the stuff that I do, you know? And, and I think that's something that I, it's a recommendation that I give women. And it's a conversation that I have with Dr. Singh, one of the episodes, you know, where I gave, gave, gave too much of myself. I put myself out there so, so much that I literally just got sick, got very, very sick from it. Right. Yeah. And a thankfully of, now, yeah. Right. A lot of psychology. A lot of it, right. yeah. There's a lot of psychological things. So if you guys haven't listened yet, y'all need to go over and uh, watch um, We we Crashed is the story right. of Adam Newman and his wife, Rebecca. Right. That's a great story on the founders and kind of analyze a little bit of his his life and his story. Um, the other one is the, the Dropout with yep. Elizabeth Holmes, which is a great, great one. And it gives you a little bit of insight on how right. um, this young woman, sure. you know, I guess at 18, 19 and just started yeah. creating she, something. Right. She was ambitious and she had, she had, and she had goals of changing the world. And, you know, I think a mm -hmm. lot of us, you know, at some point when we were kids, we have this thing, we want to leave a, a big dent in this world. And it, unfortunately, as you get older, you start realizing how much, how challenging that is. And unfortunately for her is that she kind of came close to doing it, but you know, her professors had told her at, mm -hmm. at Stanford that it's biologically and physically impossible to trying to do what you're trying to do and she didn't listen yeah so it was not a success story but they're yeah. all and the others i think that one's on hulu and yeah. we crashes on apple tv okay and that third show that um, uh super pumped super pumped was uh showtime was no it was hulu too i think not sure i don't yeah. remember it always recorded one of them was on apple oh yeah that was the no, i think crash. it was yeah no super pump was on uh showtime and then but the one consistent thing and all those storylines yeah. is they had strong charismatic uh, deity-like personalities. Very culty. Very culty. Right? That they, they ran these organizations yeah. and they convinced the people working for them they're doing great things in this world, but they just failed on the basic business acumen on the linear left brain stuff of profit. They only focused on revenue and they focused on prestige. They focused on the image, but they just didn't know how to keep the money in the bank account. It all always was always bleeding out. Theranos is a little bit different, but that was really the story of Super Uber, uh, of the Uber from Super Pumped and the yeah, Uber, and I, WeWorks. And I think the other thing is that they try to follow the 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 success of Bill Gates. They try to follow the success of Steve right. Jobs. It, they were the, it, of Zuckerberg. Like right. they had those people yes. as their gods. Right. And so whenever they would spend money, oh, you have to spend money to make money. Right. Amazon didn't make money right. until, you know, so-and-so time. They always go back to right. those people, to those right. founders, to those leaders, yeah. because they're emulating that. Right. What they forget is... Where they fall short is where was the yeah. pivot? Where was the, where was the change? And right. who was the team around them? Right. And who keeps them in check as well? Like, there's always a check right. and balance what was for everything. What was a slow motion change? It started moving from revenue to profit. That's, mm -hmm. that's where they always fall short in that storyline is to analyze those stories of Amazon, of Microsoft, of Facebook, to realize where they started making money. Yeah. It's, just, it's just decisions. It's purely decisions. I love watching those shows. Yeah, they were great. We really go in on those shows, though. Yeah. Oh, Billions. We love Billions. Yeah. Secession. That's another one. Like all of these shows with these families and these right. teams and these leaders and these yeah. crazy people at the top. I always tell Bresk, I said, how do these people make all this money? They're such idiots. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I don't get it. Well, that's kind of a strange kind of idiot. They just, they're idiots, you know, at the back end of the equation, but not in the front end of the equation. That's the problem. Thank you for being on the okay. podcast. Well, thanks for inviting me again. Next mm -hmm. time I'll bring some wine. You did good. Okay. Thank You're you. Awesome. I love you. See how I look on the other Thank camera. you, everyone. Follow us and let us know what you think about the podcast. Again, season seven, it's new and it's amazing. Thank you for listening. Friends, I must tell you, I know the place to go if you need house audio, TV installation, security monitoring. I am telling you, these people are so, so good that I cannot wait to share them with you. AVS Concepts is the place to get all 
of these things taken care of. They're the experts in audio video. If you are entertaining and you need music, call them. If you just purchased a new house and you want to have security, you've got to call them. They are the best at all of this for you. I am so excited to share them with you. They are new sponsors for the podcast. You will not not regret having them in your house. They can put anything up and create the most amazing surround sound. I am telling you, when I watch my movies, I like to watch them with surround sound. And thanks to AVS Concepts, I can do that. Follow them at their Instagram account, AVSC underscore HTX, or you can also find them at their website, avcschouston.com, and Tell them that Alicia from Vines My Alicia sent you, and they will take care of you, I promise you.